Welcome back. I thought it might be useful to do a bit of an explainer. The Mortgage Investment Corporation, or MIC, is an alternative provider of residential and commercial mortgages, targeting borrowers who don't fit within the lending parameters of the primary lenders, specifically the banks. These MICs were created by the Federal Government of Canada in 1973 through the Income Tax Act, which has the effect of taxing shareholders of the MIC as if the mortgage was held directly by that shareholder. These MICs are allowed to deduct all dividends and 50% of capital gains distributed to investors from their taxable income in the current tax year, with dividends having to be paid out within 90 days of year end. This explains why many of the MICs pay a special dividend in either December or March, so as to match total dividends paid to their taxable income. As a result, MICs distribute 100% of their taxable income, reducing their tax burden to zero. It also means that MICs have an earnings payout ratio of roughly 100%, which on the positive side implies a high dividend yield. But at the same time, these companies don't have any internally generated growth capital since retained earnings don't grow at all. This, of course, limits share price appreciation. And by the way, the dividends you receive from MICs are taxed as interest income, except for distributed capital gains, which are taxed as realized gains. As for the industry itself, there's an estimated 350 mix in Canada, though most are small, with assets of a few million dollars. But since 2010, they've really taken off in the public space, such that today there's eight TSX-listed mix managing mortgage assets of $2.6 billion. So I started off my chat with Andrew Jones of Timber Creek, and I asked him whether the catalyst for the explosive growth we've seen in the sector was the financial crisis. I would say that the, the really the material growth in the mixed sector happened following the credit crisis and the reasons for that are primarily the fact that um, following the credit crisis bank lenders really tightened up the parameters under which they would do business. In addition to that, the securitization lending business which prior to the credit crisis accounted for approximately <coughs> excuse me a third of the uh, mortgage lending in Canada on the commercial side, that, that disappeared completely. So those two factors led to a meteoric rise in um, uh, available capital for mix which backfilled that hole in the market. So by more mortgage securitization you mean the banks packaging up your mortgage, my mortgage and selling it into the marketplace? That's correct. So that that money really went away. That business was shut down uh, for a long period of time and has only surfaced in a small way since then. So as a result of those changes people that were looking for a mortgage found yeah. it in other places. Yeah, the mix really filled that hole uh, in Canada. In the U.S. there were uh, mortgage REITs that, that backfilled that space. In Canada it was really the Canadian mix that did that. Why We didn't have mortgage REITs up here? Or why it, don't we? It, it's a tax structure. Uh, it's a slightly different. So it works in the States but it doesn't work in Canada? That's correct. Yeah. Right, okay. So what are the key rules that mix uh, operate under? Well, there, first is the tax rule, which is the um, uh, which requires MIX to invest uh, more than a minimum of 50% of their assets in residential type assets. Now, those residential assets can be um, uh, loans secured by apartment buildings, uh, retirement homes, anything where right. people can live in them. It can be homes as well. Uh, that was the intention of it when it was when it was written, um, but. The other thing is that mix tend or also operate with certain investment restrictions. So that and that varies from mix to mix. It's really it can be very different from uh, from one um, you know one company to the next. So are there other regulatory forces that you operate under aside uh, from the uh, tax act? Yes, all publicly traded mix are governed by their by the uh, securities regulators. So in our case, it's the OSC. Mm -hmm. We have fairly strict governance as a result. Now, this is different from other types of mortgage lenders, OSFI regulated lenders, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So OSFI regula regulated lenders are lenders uh, such as banks and trust companies that, that use depositors' money for lending. Um, MIX can do that too if they're CDIC uh, approved, um, and the only one that, is, that I know of is, is MCAN. 
Um, but that is a very different structure. Their, their cost of capital is much cheaper because they are using depositors' money. Um, however, they have much more, uh, much larger restrictions as a result of OSFI governance. And home capital would also fall under that category. That's correct. Home capital is a trust company. It's very similar. Now, I also hear that retail investors and institutional investors will invest in syndicated mortgages. What's the difference of a syndicated mortgage as opposed to me investing in a MIC? Well, a syndicated mortgage is just simply a mortgage that's been shared amongst one or two or more groups. So, uh, you know, an investor investing in a syndicated mortgage has to be careful because they're putting all their eggs in one basket, and they have to be careful that they have a proper manager, such that, or, or so that in the event that there is a problem with the mortgage, such as a default, they have a good manager to work that out. When you're when you're buying a MIC. You're getting a diversified portfolio of mortgages. So, you know, typically, uh, uh, if you have uh, one issue with one mortgage, it's one of, say, 100 or 150. So, much more diverse, a little bit safer, in our opinion. Uh, in addition to that, you're getting the benefit of the management. Management is um, is key. If you have problems in the portfolio, it is not. Uh, if it's not that easy to work out if you don't have the understanding of the markets, uh, the laws, etc., and have the contacts to deal with them. Now, these syndicated mortgages appear to offer incredibly attractive yields, higher yields than mix, but of course there comes a cost to that, right? Well, of course, and if, if you don't pick the, the right mortgage, um, then, you know, the, then you can have some real but, problems. But not just the right mortgage. I mean, you know, somebody buys land and then somebody completes building the apartment building, the senior's home or the house. So there's a whole chain of potential places to invest, right? And do these syndicated mortgages go earlier than you do? Well, it really depends. I guess the, the key on the syndicated mortgage is that there are no parameters around which the mortgage has to fit in. So in our mix, we have investment restrictions that do not let us go beyond certain loan-to-value ratios. It doesn't let us put too many eggs in one basket. Uh, and it, and you know, it requires us to have a certain amount of equity in the property so the borrowers uh, you know, are... are, um, are are exposed with with a syndicated mortgage there could be no equity in the property there's no parameters there's there's no you know um, anything really wrapping up what you have to do it's really a wide open slate uh, and it's really up to the person who places the mortgage to, to make that decision and when the financial crisis occurred seven years ago some of these things had problems that's correct and particularly uh, a lot of the land loan exposure that was right. out there people people lost their principal uh, or some of their principal right so back to mix then are there a couple of different types of mix that are out there could you explain well each mix i mean when you are choosing a mix what you want to do is understand the investment parameters that the mix uh, mm -hmm. that are uh, you know built into the mix so, uh, so there are mix that focus on land and construction there are mix that focus on single housing uh, single-family housing. Mm -hmm. uh, our mix, for example, uh, focus and lend primarily against cash-flowing properties. So we don't. Our yield is slightly lower than some of the other groups out there. However, when you are lending against cash-flowing properties, you tend to have uh, a lower default risk and and a lower risk of impairment. Um, so you know you have to look at the underlying security, the parameters in which the, the MIC can lend, and then the diversification policies and, the, and you know the and likes of those. What's just quickly, Andrew? What's the difference between a senior MIC and a blended MIC? Well, senior MICs uh, imply, and you have to check the investment restrictions, but senior MICs only invest in first mortgage loans. Right. So, you know, the, the thought being that that is safer than having a second mortgage loan. Now, um, the, 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 there's a lot of truth to that, but I think you also have to look at the underlying security because first mortgage loans against land can be, you know, can, can, can still be risky uh, investments. Up next, more of my conversation with Andrew Jones of Timber Creek. He's going to tell us what a typical deal looks like in this space and how you can make money. No broker, no advisor, no TV expert. Nobody can help you make money in the stock market like VectorVest. Only VectorVest 7 Canada Real-Time gives you the system you need to pick winners day in and day out. Not just raw data, a real system tick by tick all day long. Pick winner after winner with the amazing Midas Touch Cherry Picking System. It's a simple, fast and effective method for finding hot stocks on the move. This stock selection technique finds big winners in literally seconds. 
It scans more than 8,000 stocks and ETFs to reveal the ones that are perfectly poised to deliver explosive profits. Nobody else has it. Nobody else does it. When to buy, what to buy, when to sell. The answers you need to make money. VectorVest 7 Canada Real Time. Visit VectorVest.ca to order your risk-free trial. Nobody else has it. Nobody else does it. And it's guaranteed. Welcome back. Now, more of my interview with Andrew Jones, the CEO of Timber Creek Mortgage Investment Corp. And I asked him what a typical deal looks like. Well, we've, we focus, as I mentioned earlier, on, on lending against cash flowing properties. But uh, our typical deals are very short term because we are charging a little bit more. And, um, and you know, typically borrowers don't want to pay it for a long time or can't afford to. So, for example, we will have uh, a, a property that is, call it a, a retail small shopping center, mm -hmm. but it's got 30% of the center vacant. Okay. Um, the reason it's vacant is you may have an older uh, manager or older owner who's, who's not paying attention to it, already makes enough money. Right. Right. So, uh, so what needs to be done is my, my client will purchase the property. They'll want to do some minor renovation to the property and then lease up that vacant space. Now, keeping in mind that there is a lot of existing cash flow there. Right. So uh, my client will go to the bank and the bank will say, well, you know, I, I, I would do this loan for you, but I will give you 50% of your purchase price and, um, and really I want to lock it up for five years because the bank is in the business of you know, doing longer term loans. Right. Whereas we'll offer a very short term loan, 18 to 24 months, the borrower right. can repay it at any time and we'll give that borrower 75% of the purchase price. So the borrower still has a lot of cash in the deal, we think more than enough. Mm -hmm. It's an experienced borrower, done this many times and then they'll buy the property, close it, renovate it. We're getting a better property through the process, and then they'll lease it up over time. As soon as it's leased up, they'll refinance typically with the bank as well, and we'll get repaid. And, that, and they'll do that with their long-term debt, meaning five, seven, or ten-year loan. And that's a typical transaction for us. So you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to ask you, why do they want short-term money when rates are so low and they could lock it in for five years or even longer? But it's because they just want the short-term money until they fill up that 30% that's vacant. That's, that's correct. Right. And the bank okay. will not give them credit for that right. vacant right. space. Be until so it's when I get to a Timber Creek uh, Mortgage Corporation, what does the P&L look like? What's the income statement look like from the transaction you're describing? Uh, well, the, the income statement will, uh, in terms of the, 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 uh, what the borrower is providing on mm -hmm. the property, uh, typically there will be at least one one cover. So that means there's more than enough cash flow to actually make the annual payments. So right. if, the borrower, uh, if the borrower does not get the lease up done in time right. or is delaying the renovation for some reason, then there's still the cash flow from the property to service our debt. So it looks very good for us. And, it's one of the reasons we were able to sustain ourselves during the credit crisis is we did have those cash flowing properties. Right, but what are you going to charge me for that loan that you're talking about and what are your costs associated with it and what do you put to the bottom line that you yeah. didn't pay out? Well, it, okay, so that depends on which mortgage corp it's going into, but if that was a And first you've got a couple of mortgage corps. That's correct. So if that's a first mortgage, the bank would probably charge the borrower uh, prime one and a half to prime two for that loan, so let's call it... Uh, Four and a half to five percent. Okay. We would charge six to six and a half percent for that same loan. So we're charging a premium of say two hundred basis points. Uh, for us, that provides you know a, a very nice return for our investors if it goes into our senior mortgage corporation. Uh, for the borrower, it's an extra couple hundred basis points that they pay on a loan that they're effectively capitalizing like it's a construction loan, and it works very very well for them because it's a short period of time. Okay, fair game. Yeah. Now, what differentiates Timber Creek from the other mix that are out there? Well, there are you know there are several, and again, I mm -hmm. think it it comes down to the diversification policies, the the um, uh, the strategies that they that you know that are employed. But ours, our our mix are focused on lending against cash flowing properties, right? And so that is eighty percent of the product in there. And again, we are not generating the same yield as if we went into land and construction. 
um, but we are a much more defensive strategy. There are MICs that are very focused on land and construction. Today, there's a shortage of that capital in the market, and those MICs are generating very strong yield today. So I want to show our viewers a table of your two MICs. There's TMC and there's MTG. Those are the tickers on the TSX. Yes. Could you just walk us through the differences between the two MICs? Sure. So MTG is our, is our senior MIC. Uh, so it is so it only invests in first mortgages? That's correct. It invests in first mortgages. The maximum loan to value in that MIC is 70%. Our average loan to value is quite a bit lower. That means every borrower has a minimum of 30 plus percent equity in that right. deal behind us. Right. So that's a very safe um, a very safe investment. We do use leverage in that mix because it's such a safe investment um, and that allows us to pay out about 60 cents a year. What kind of leverage are you using that one? Uh, we're using about 25 uh, percent. Okay. Yeah. And what about TMC? Could you so TMC, that which has been around for a long time now, and you know, when, when choosing any MIC, the track record of the borrower we think is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Management is very, very key. Um, so TMC invests in a combination of first mortgages and second mortgages, uh, and it also will take loans that are blanket loans with a first mortgage on one property and a second on another. Okay. So and the loan to value ratio that is the maximum there is 85 percent. So the borrowers don't have to have as much equity. In the deal. But having said that, we've had a great track record and it does pay out more. You're generating another 150 to 200 basis points in yield on that MIC. And do either of these MICs invest in single family condos? Uh, no. Like an individual unit? No, we wouldn't. We don't lend to what I call end users, so people who are you know living in their condos. Right. We do lend to developers. We do not. Uh, we do not finance the condo development industry in our mix. Uh, there are others that do that, but we don't. What about uh, reserve policy for losses? What's your loss experience like? How safe are the, have the mix been? Yeah, well, so that's a very good question. Uh, our mix, we've actually never had an impairment of capital. Uh, we've, we've you know, written off some costs and a little bit of interest occasionally, but it's been very, very minimal and we've had a great track record. We do carry a reserve uh, and it varies from year to year. Housing market in Canada, should I be worried? Well, we, you know, we, again, we don't invest in the housing market uh, in any material right. way. Right. Uh, but ha but having said that, we track it quite closely, and we feel pretty good about the housing market today. I think the government's done a, a reasonably good job of tampering things, um, although you know there there has been a, a rise. But the Canadian housing market's very fragmented and has very different drivers in different parts of the country. Office market, Toronto and Calgary. There's a fair bit of building going on in those two cities. Are there going to be some challenges for investors in those office real estate markets a couple of years from now? Well, I, you know, I think the office markets in, across the country are fairly strong, and they're de dominated by large institutions. There's, you know, the bulk of the office markets in Canada are held by pension plans, uh, large, large investors, overseas investors, life insurance companies. And those are deep-pocketed companies with with no leverage or very little leverage, um, and so they can sustain themselves through these, through these, uh, you know, if there's a little excess supply. I also think they're thinking ahead. They don't want to cannibalize their own business. So they're looking at adding supply two to three to four years out, and they're doing it based on projections. And I okay. think it's a paced addition to the market. And just, just lastly and quickly, Andrew, what do you want to tell viewers about payout ratios and dividend policies for investors in your two mix? Well, our, our payout ratios, we try to keep uh, at exactly what we're earning. That's, that's, you know, that's what we attempt to do. Uh, we're not trying to return capital. We're also, you know, we're also not trying to knock it out of the park and generate very high yields. We're trying to generate a reasonable yield and take as little risk as possible. That was Andrew Jones, the CEO of Timber Creek Mortgage Investment Corp. Up next, I'll preview the trading week ahead.